If you had asked me earlier in my career what the main advantage of a monorepo is, I would have given you a clear answer. I can easily make changes across multiple modules in a single commit. So for example, I could store the code for my front-end, back-end, and some internal libraries all in the same repo. But let's say I want to make a change to the logging library, which is used in both the front-end and back-end. Since all three modules are within the same repo, I can make changes to the library and both consumers in a single atomic commit or pull request. While this is a huge advantage, it also comes with a really significant downside that is often overlooked, since it only reveals itself gradually as your repo and team grows. Before adopting a mono repo, your team has to make one major decision that can affect the entire development process. I'm going to show you exactly what that decision is, so you can make the right call for your team. So in a poly repo, you put each module in its own repo. You can then import dependencies by using a package manager like npm or pip. If you don't want to publish your internal library to the public npm registry, you can either use an internal package registry or point your package.json directly at the repo URL and use a tag to specify the desired version. Alternatively, you can also use git directly to import those libraries with git submodules or git subtree. The major downside of having multiple repos is that whenever you want to make a change that affects more than one of them, you'll have to create a separate commit for each of them. Like in the earlier example, let's say you want to update the logging library and its consumers. You'll need to find that repo and clone it, create a branch, make the code change, commit it, and make a pull request. And then, depending on your team's workflows, you might even have to wait for a review before you can merge it and release a new version. Then you need to track down all the repos that consume this library and update them with the new version there, where you have to go through all this effort for each repo again. Alternatively, if you use Git submodules, you have to deal with all the complexity that they bring along, which I've done a full video about here. Contrast this to the monorepo approach, where all you need to do is clone the monorepo, which you usually only do once, make the code change on a new branch, and then you can already update all consumers before you even commit. You only have to go through this process once and you don't have to wait for reviews in between. The entire feature is then contained in a single atomic commit, even if it spans across multiple modules. If necessary, you can also make multiple commits that you then later squash via pull request. See my full video on this here. This makes it easy to see in the commit history where a feature that affects the entire system was introduced and rollbacks are much easier if necessary, since you can just revert that single commit. Compare this to a polyrepo approach, where the feature is split across many commits over multiple repos, which you'd have to track all down and revert separately. Monorepos also have other advantages. You can use full text search and IDE features like refactoring tools across all modules out of the box. You can still do this in a well configured polyrepo with submodules. But I think a monorepo still makes this a touch easier to set up. As your company grows, the number of modules can also grow immensely. I've worked with companies that had hundreds or even thousands of repos in their org. Finding the code that you need can be a challenge in this scenario, and monorepos simplify this. It's also much easier to enforce consistent rules like code formatting, linters, and build rules across the entire org via your CI. Now, it seems that monorepos have some clear advantages. So how can I claim that they make dependency management more complex? Well, I found that these advantages also come with a significant restriction. Whenever you make a change to an internal library, you're also forced to upgrade all its consumers immediately. So for example, let's say you want to improve the logging in the front end here. But to do that, you need to make a breaking change to the shared logging library. However, the backend also heavily depends on this library and updating the backend would be a significant amount of work. Depending on the state of your project, this might not always be feasible. For example, if adding this feature to the front end is urgent, you might not have the time to do a major refactor in the backend just to make it work with the updated library, especially if you don't need that new feature in the backend right away. In a polyrepo setup, you could just leave the backend untouched, but in a monorepo, you're forced to upgrade all consumers immediately. The main reason for this is the way internal dependencies are usually managed in a monorepo. Normally, all consumers always use the latest version of the internal library. Usually, this is implemented by using a concept like workspaces in NPM, or a similar feature in your language's package manager. The root-level package.json defines a workspace, which includes all modules here. 
This way the consumers, like our backend here, don't even need to specify a version number. You're just consuming the library in its current state and the package manager will find it via a relative path that points to the correct directory in the monorepo, as it is currently checked out on your hard drive. So let's say we make the breaking change to our logging library here, as well as in our front end, but we simply don't update the backend at the same time. Now the backend will fail to build, since it tries to consume the updated library with the breaking change. Some people will argue that this is actually a good thing, since being forced to upgrade will make sure that your consumers are always up to date and are using the latest version of your internal libraries. In practice, I found that this just isn't always possible or desirable. Keep in mind that this is just a simple example with two consumers. I found that as your project and the number of consumers grow, upgrading them all can become a major burden. Of course, there are multiple ways you can work around this problem. For example, whenever you make a breaking change to a library, you could make sure the library is still backwards compatible with old consumers. In our logging library, let's say we want to add a new parameter to this method. We can't just add it to the existing method, since this would break any callers that haven't been updated yet. So instead, we could just keep the old version around and add a new method. We can also add a deprecation warning to the old method. Another alternative is to add a feature flag that we pass to our logger. Then, instead of introducing a new method, we can check for our feature flag at runtime and choose the correct code path. This lets you update your front end to use the new feature while your back end still uses the old code path. While both these methods work, it increases complexity, introduces technical debt, and needs to be cleaned up later when all consumers have been updated to the latest version, which is easy to forget. There's another way to work around having to update all consumers immediately. You can introduce an internal package registry or artifact server. This is kind of like having your own company internal NPM server, where you can publish and fetch internal libraries from. There are many tools out there for this, like the GitLab package registry or JFrog Artifactory, and they have support for lots of different programming languages. You would then publish all your internal libraries to it with fixed versions. When building a consumer, the package manager then no longer uses relative paths like in a typical monorepo approach. Instead, each dependency is pinned to a specific version of the package and always fetches it from the internal registry. However, I think this approach is a bit of an anti-pattern, since it can lead to some confusing scenarios. Let's take our previous example, where we update the logging library. Let's say we publish it to the internal package registry, and then update our front end to use the latest version. But we don't have time to update the backend, so it is still pinned to an older version from the internal registry. While this works, I think it's quite confusing, since now the latest commit in the repo contains the latest version of the logging library, but the backend actually uses an older version from a previous commit in the same repo. This means that the backend doesn't actually use the code from the current commit. This kinda undermines the main advantage of a monorepo that we talked about earlier since the whole point was that your latest commit contains all the code that is currently being consumed. This also reduces the usefulness of full text search and refactoring tools. For example, version 2.0 of the logging library might have removed a function, which was still present in the old version. Since the full text search can only see what's on disk, it won't find it. This is even worse if the function signature remains the same, but the underlying implementation changes you can no longer rely on the fact that all the code that is currently on your hard drive is also the one that is being consumed. Monorepos also have some other disadvantages. Most importantly, good tooling is crucial. I'd argue that after a certain scale, this is also true for polyrepos, but with monorepos, you'll hit the point where you're forced to invest in tooling much sooner. At the very least, you need a build tool like NX, TurboRepo, or Bazel that's specifically designed to handle a monorepo at scale. Otherwise, whenever you push a minor change to any module, your CI will rebuild the entire repo, which would take forever. You need a tool that can build only what's needed and cache build artifacts in a smart way. Going deep into tooling is out of scope for this video, but let me know in the comments if you'd like to learn more about this in the future. Even with good tooling, one big restriction is that you can't give fine-grained read access to your repo. For example, if you want your front-end team to only see the front-end code and your back-end team to only see the back-end code, that's not really possible. 
This can be particularly challenging when you need to share code with external partners or when you want to open source only certain parts of your code base. Another issue I've seen in really big projects is that the repo can actually grow to a size where it becomes hard to manage with Git. And common operations like cloning the repo or even switching branches can get quite slow. But this really only seems to be a problem for huge organizations with hundreds of thousands of files and commits. All right, so which of the two approaches should you choose? I think it ultimately depends on the size and structure of your company and how far along your product is. Here's my practical suggestion. Always start with a mono repo. As long as you only have a handful of applications and internal libraries, it's definitely the simpler approach. As the repo grows, more and more modules get added and your libraries get more mature. Once a library starts having multiple consumers, your team has to make a decision. Do you want to subscribe to the idea that whenever you make a change to a dependency, you also want to update all consumers of that dependency? Or at least, are you willing to invest in making those changes backwards compatible? For example, via feature flags, as I mentioned earlier. If the answer is yes, then stick with a mono repo. If this approach doesn't work for you, for any of the reasons I mentioned earlier, I don't see a problem with splitting out this single library into its own repo and integrating it via package manager or submodules. This way, you're making a conscious decision to defer system integration to a later time. Because of that, I only recommend doing this for relatively mature libraries with lots of consumers, where the library is probably owned and managed by a separate team. Personally, I don't believe in splitting up your repo prematurely, but only once a specific problem emerges that can be solved easily by moving that module into its own repo. I also don't think that just because a module is managed by a separate team, it needs to be in its own repo. I sometimes see people mentioning team splitting as an argument for polyrepos, but really this feels to me like using a technical solution to solve a management problem. As your organization grows and you opportunistically split out repos, after some time, you might hit a point again where the sheer amount of separate repos gets overwhelming. At this point, you can consider returning to a strict monorepo approach. I've seen this happen at fairly large organizations with at least a few hundred engineers and multiple hundreds or even thousands of repos. At this point, you have the resources to invest in strong internal tooling, like an internal package registry. Good tooling can counter most of the disadvantages I mentioned earlier. At that scale, you're going to need internal tooling anyways, regardless of whether you pick a monorepo or a polyrepo approach. And because of that, I think for many companies that become this big, a monorepo is still the better choice. If you have to make that tooling investment anyways, you might as well get all the advantages in discoverability, full text search, CI, and refactoring that a monorepo brings. But really, don't underestimate the level of scale that you actually need to make it worth that investment. People tend to forget that companies like Google have spent millions of dollars on getting all this tooling ready. And just because Google scale tools like Basil and so are freely available, doesn't mean that they necessarily scale down to smaller companies. So always choose the right tools for your specific situation and needs. If your team isn't quite there yet, you can use the link below to book a free 15 minute audit of your build pipeline and repo strategy. I'll help you get clarity on where your biggest bottlenecks are and offer some practical next steps you can take to start making improvements. I also have a hands-on Git workshop for individuals and teams coming up soon. Click the link below for more info. Thanks for watching Philomatics and have a great day.